Good to see people again, right? <laughs> this is almost like pre pandemic level. So we're glad everybody's here. My name is Tim Hopkins with Keller Williams Realty. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you yet. I know we've got some familiar faces and some new faces. Uh, we'd like to start by thanking our sponsors. We've got our brown sponsor, Mark Thompson, Pool Inspectors of Georgia. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Uh, our gold sponsor is Jan Rooney with State Farm. I don't think Jan's here tonight. Okay, so Jan with State Farm. And our title sponsor for years, and we certainly appreciate Buford Finance and Mortgage, Jack Williams. So let's bring up Jack. Uh, thank you so much. Hello, that. will echo Tim's comment. It is really nice to be here in person and see everyone. And uh, so excited for today. Excited to hear what the mayor's got to say about things going on in the county. Um, it's been a while since we've spoken uh, face to face. Uh, my business partner and I, Tony Flory, celebrated our 21st year in business here in coming in Lakeland Plaza uh, this past October. And uh, we've been uh, talking about being in business for 21 years, and a lot of you um, that were in business in the 2000s saw what happened in 07 to 2010, 2011, and we were just commenting on that, how easy it was for anybody to buy a house back then, right? And today, it's a different world. It really is. Uh, not only from the mortgage standpoint, but from the home value process and so forth. Um, to touch on something totally not mortgage related, uh, we were, uh, Justin and I were looking yesterday uh, at a video, and some of you may have seen it, Jim and I talked about it, about the first 3D printed home. Did any of you guys see this? It, it's absolutely amazing. I've heard about this last year, but we watched the video yesterday. You can Google it up. It was uh, in conjunction with Alquest 3D and Habitat for Humanity. They built this home in Richmond, Virginia. It took 22 hours to print a home. <laughs> and when you go online and look at it, you know, it is set up with this huge pump coming over and it's just going back and forth in layers of concrete to build the walls. And in 22 hours, they'll build, they're building a 2,200 square foot home. And they indicated that over the next couple of years, they'll in, they, they should be at a 30% cost saving ratio compared to stick frame homes. Uh, the, I was joking with Justin, it's like, well, it shouldn't cost anything to insure that. Like, what's going to hurt it, right? It's concrete. Um, but it's, it's pretty cool. I, I, I tell you, look it up. It's, uh, it's pretty neat. The other thing they talked about is that from an energy efficiency standpoint, it's 50, 60% better than a stick frame home. Um, and it takes three to four people to build it. And they're like, what does it take? How many, how many crews does it take to build a house today? A heck of a lot more than three or four people, right? Yeah, yeah, really. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, uh, I'm sure uh, the, uh, the everyone's aware where rates are going with the feds. Feds are meeting again next week. It's anticipated they'll bump rates in March by quarter. Um, they're indicating perhaps three or four rate increases this year. Um, kind of what we're looking at from a, your buyer standpoint is up until early December, we were right, walking 30 year fixed loans at 275. Best case scenario, the look this morning is three and three eighths. So uh, you're up about a half percent from early December where rates are today. Given the fact that home sales are so high, that's obviously a direct correlation to what your client's mortgage payments are going to be and what they qualify for. So that's something to keep in mind with people that are on the fence. It's in the newspaper. It's on the news every day about rates increasing. There's kind of an extra tool in your belt right there to kind of push people along that are sitting on the fence. Go ahead and get locked in while you can, if you can find them a house. So um, that's, that's about it. If, uh, if I can help with anything, Provide any uh, information to your buyers, uh, please let us know. Uh, Tony and I are available 24 7. And that's uh, again, good to see everybody here today. Thank yeah, you for your support. Second homes, are those rates crazier? 
Uh, no, actually, no. Well, it's going to be the same thing uh, as a primary. There's really no different in a second home than your primary, other than normal values. Um, but um, uh, we, we're seeing a lot of second homes. Hey, the other thing I will touch on, I was on Steve earlier, is, um, and I know that you guys are battling this sometimes with appraisals, where they're going in, obviously, above list price. Uh, we've got one right now, and, and this is going to blow you away. It's going to decide. The home was on the market for $550. It went changed up to $560. Clients went in, put an offer on it for $560. Appraisal came in at $501. Yeah. And the buyers and sellers agreed on $525, and the deal is going to close, but they're bringing an extra twenty four dollars the closing to make it happen, and the seller came off. So it's still some crazy things going on with, with the sales process and appraisals. Some are coming in, some are some not so much. But that's the highest discrepancy I've seen in forever. So Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the mayor is telling us Steve Schultz here, who's in the appraisal uh, business for 30 years, and give us an update on what's going on in that, that industry changing big time. We have Tim Abney here, who works with all national builders, to tell us what builders are seeing in Forsyth County right now. Uh, so we got a lot of good information for you. One other person I want to recognize, you can help me welcome a new member to Forsyth County team, is Taylor Hall. If you want to say hi, Taylor, and she's doing community outreach. So. Look here for you to get with them and see what people want. Yeah, so welcome aboard. Good to have you. All right, so we're going to introduce Troy. Uh, most of y'all are familiar with him and he's super humble, but I got a couple of paragraphs that read Troy to update people. In 2017, Mayor Brumbelow became the first new mayor of Cumming since 1970. He's well acquainted with Cumming, having attended and graduated in the first class for South Forsyth High, South Forsyth High School before going on to Gainesville State College. Local business owner, building homes and businesses in Forsyth County. Mayor Burma lives in Cumming with his wife, Jody, and their two children. Greatly enjoys his work of building Cumming into a more vibrant, more diverse community in which to work, play, and live. And what we're here to hear about the Cumming City Center is the vision of Mayor Troy Brumelow, who heavily promoted the idea of creating the center during his 2017 mayoral campaign in order to bring back some of the small town charm that has been lost in downtown coming over the years. At the same time, establishing a new community gathering place. I uh, immediately went to work on the project, and if you've driven by there now, it's exciting stuff going up uh, seemingly every day. So please help me welcome Mr. Mayor Charles Romano. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Hold the stand on this blue tape. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks for having me. Um, we're really excited about the city, the city center. Um, I'm ready for it to be done. We've been dealing with this. We broke ground in August of 2019. Um, so, uh, you know, a year uh, a year ago we started vertical construction, and that's getting close to being finished. Um, spring may end up being. Uh, May or June, I think uh, we're getting the supply chain issue problems now. So a glass garage door takes eight months to get for some reason. Uh, so stuff like that is what slowed us down a little bit. This is a, a view from above. Um, the project now totals about 95 acres. Um, they're uh, it's centered around an amphitheater in the middle. It'll seat anywhere from 2,500 to up to about 8,000. Now, 8,000 means we're shoulder to shoulder. Um, problem is we don't have enough parking for 8,000. So we can really pull off about 5,000 people. Um, and we'll end up doing our acts based on that. You know, we can't bring in Garth Brooks. <laughs> we don't have enough parking. Um, we'll end up having... Uh, Two buildings out, if you drove by on Highway 20, building M and L up there. Uh, we've got, um, I'll wait till I get to the individual to tell you about each one. Uh, so this is taking a little while back, some of the boardwalks that go through the middle. Um, 
there was a big stream restoration project that we did in the middle of the property. There were four streams that came together into one. It goes, uh, hopefully I didn't break it, but it goes under Highway 20. Um, so we worked with the Corps engineers and rebuilt the stream into the perfect stream. It was straight where farmers had straightened it out to maximize land space. Uh, well, when you do that, water goes faster, you get more erosion. So we went through the core and went in. Now it's the perfect meandering stream. Uh, so you got about a 25 acre park in the middle of the center. Um, this is building A. This is going to be the home to uh, Homestead Bar and Grill. Anybody's familiar with Rosati's down on 141? It's the same owners. Um, but half of the main level is going to be sliceability, which is pizza by the slice. The ability part of that is most of the employees will be special needs adults. So um, that's really neat. Uh, it's a three level, it's got a roof top, main level, and a basement. Uh, this is kind of in the heart that lines up with the city center, uh, with the uh, amphitheater uh, buildings, B and C. Um, and I know I'm gonna mess some of this up, but the basement of Building C, uh, that is a distillery uh, that does like vodkas, the clear liquors, and they're gonna have a speakeasy um, and restaurant. Um, the basement of Building B uh, is uh, Los Rios is doing a cantina concept with a wall of margarita machines. I said, how many are you going to have? I said, as many as we can fit on the wall. So, um, we've got uh, several other businesses upstairs. We've got a uh, shaved ice, but that really doesn't explain it. Uh, it's more like fall and snow. That's kind of the consistency as they explained it to me. Um, I said you can get Red Devil uh, cake or strawberry cheesecake and it's like 170 calories so these are some as built what's going on now these are still a little old because a lot of these have brick on them now this is building d uh, which houses 10 cup grill um, i actually went with them to pittsburgh pennsylvania yesterday to show them a um, restaurant i found up there where you have steak on a stone so they heat up this stone about this big, uh, it's a lava rock. And that they heat it up to 800 degrees and then they bring your steak out on it and they've just seared it and you finish cooking it, cutting it, cooking it on that stone. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. So they're excited and they think they're gonna incorporate that into the restaurant. Um, the 10 cup grill is also, when we get to it, they're doing the miniature golf course. Um, just some construction pictures. There's from the rooftop of that building. Great view of Sawney Mountain. This is the miniature golf course that they're building, something similar to this. This was built by the same guy, uh, but this was out in Arizona. And there's kind of some under construction. It's gonna have famous holes from around the world, and then we have signature holes from a lot of the courses in the county. Um, so we got any golfers in here? They're like country land, a little part three over the pond. That's going to be over here. <laughs> and we actually we have uh, somebody donated to me the granite marker from the Lanier Golf Club that's no longer here, uh, and they recreated hole five from Lanier Golf Course. And so that that marker will be out on the course. <laughs> Well, we've got a main corner at Augusta National and all that good stuff. This is building E. That's the last building that's went up. Uh, this is going to house our brewery. Um, so he started uh, Jekyll when they started Jekyll Brewing, if we got any beer aficionados, uh, and Gate City. So now he's going out on his own. Um, it's going to have a permanent food truck, Airstream trailer food truck with coastal Georgia cuisine. It has a rooftop as well. And I still can't get them to get rid of this picture that says Cummings. <laughs> um, 
So it's drove me nuts and it still never changed. Um, so this is on the main street. Uh, you can see that that looks made to look like an old fire station. Well, it's actually going to have the city's last fire truck. When the city had a volunteer fire department, it's going to be in one of the bays and it's going to be a memorial to fallen firemen uh, and a tribute to our fire department, you know, here in the county and what we had in the city. Uh, to the right side of that's going to be a coffee shop. So you can go in the coffee shop, have access to it, it'll all be free. But the fire chief's helping me out, uh, donating a lot of memorabilia and artifacts and that kind of stuff to, to decorate it with. Uh, we're working with a co-working space. I think they're about to sign for the entire upstairs of that building, which is about 12,000 square feet. Um, and then we've got several boutiques. Uh, a lot of those have been mentioned already. There's the city's fire truck. Uh, building uh, G is kind of made to look like an old movie theater by the marquee in the middle. Um, that has office space above, Retail on the bottom. I know we've got a barber shop, and uh, I think this one has the bakery with a tea room. Uh, we've announced that one. Um, we have a lot of tenants in the pipeline, and we're purposely <clears throat> spoon feeding that out. You know, we we can throw a whole list out right now of all of them, but that's not building the excitement. And they, this way, they get their day in the sun with the newspaper and that kind of stuff introduce them once at a, one at a time. So building age, you can see all the architecture. What we wanted the architecture to look like is Main Street America from, you know, 100 years ago. So that was what went into the design of all of it. This will be our future police department and municipal uh, court building. Um, that's about 15,000 square feet, so it's nothing huge. Um, but the building they're working out of now was built in 1970, and it was City Hall, Water Department, Street Department, you name it. Um, and it has a lot of problems. So uh, this will also, it's going to have um, a porch area by the front door. Uh, if any of you have paid attention where the city restored a police car um, after, uh, as a tribute to two uh, sheriff's deputies that got killed in the early 70s. That will be parked out front, and that will be a memorial to any fallen law enforcement officers that we've had. So there's Bill Nell up near the front. Um, Jennifer's uh, in close to signing the lease on that one. Uh, building M, we're really close to signing with a pour in tap. They specialize in craft beers uh, on tap. But their food would be burgers. That's what they're specializing in. The water tower that you see there is that's been built now. Uh, one of our city staff is painting the city center logo on it. So it will go up in the next few days. It's really not a water tank, uh, it's really a big sign. But the unique part of it is it has a door that opens and telecommunications companies have paid for this uh, they're going to have cell towers inside of it so that way we're hiding the cell towers we got we're boosting the signal over there uh, and the city's making some money uh, so that water tower kind of goes right in here that building has a rooftop it's great views all the rooftops we've got four buildings with rooftops and a parking deck Kind of the theme behind the water tank. So here's if any of you bought a brick during our buy brick program, but we'll go around the, the fountain there that lines up uh, with the amphitheater and the grand staircase. There's kind of a picture of the grand staircase coming down. There's an elevator over to the left. Uh, this is a park that we have that's over near the amphitheater. Um, they'll have AstroTurf and all that. The Kiwanis Club is paying for this. Uh, that merry-go-round uh, is wheelchair accessible. Um, so it's going to be a really neat project. Uh, so a lot of thanks to the Kiwanis Club. 
there's the some renderings of kind of what the amphitheater is going to look like. What we build is really close to, to this picture here. Uh, it's got the pond around it, and there's actually a bridge, concrete bridge, you walk over the pond. And all along the back, there's stone sitting along where you can just go out, eat your ice cream, uh, drink a beer, whatever. Um, we have a pocket park. Uh, the city's kind of known for our steam engine parade. And uh, we have one pocket park that was going to have a fountain in it. And then we found out, well, the fountain's going to be $200,000. Um, so let's go about that differently. So we paid $17,000 for the steam engine. Um, and uh, Dal Vaughn that works for us is very talented. He has repainted and restored it. So it'll look like you know a brand new one. And that will be a, a focal point in one of the pocket parks. But tons of magnolia trees through the property. Um, any questions? I do. What's going to happen to the old city police department, that building? So we don't really know. We don't have a, um, a plan, so to speak. Uh, you know, we're probably a couple of years away uh, from building the police department over there. Uh, the city has impact fees, and uh, part of that is for public safety. Well, it's to keep the same level of service. Well, to me, the same level of service and for police departments, as your city grows, you need more policemen. But the way the law is written, you can only build buildings with it. So we're going to wait until we've collected some more impact fees to, uh, to build that. Um, but back to the other, there's been no, no decision made, but uh, I think what makes a lot of sense for us over there would probably be a park and some parking. Uh, but we'll see what city council wants to do. But we really haven't decided on, on that. Is all the safety and leasing the city, or is anybody actually buying? Yeah, so the center is owned by the city's <laughs> downtown development authority. Um, so they'll be paying rent to our development authority. Um, and then uh, there is some property, there's a, a boutique hotel we're talking to right now. But uh, if any of you are familiar with that, Alpharetta, it's a Hamilton hotel down there. Very nice. Yes. The architecture fits the city center. Yeah. So we're talking with them right now. You know, if we did something with them, that'd be where we'd have to sell them. Uh, so, you know, hopefully we can work that deal out. But, but as far as all the other retail buildings, the city owns it and rents it out. So we'll end up making about three million a year in revenue to the city. Yeah. Well, hey, I'm so sorry I missed that on the brick project. Can't y'all extend and allow some of us? Well, we may be able to pick it up again at a later date. We okay. had to cut it off at a point so they could manufacture them. Okay. So, okay. so we we kind of had a date and extended and extended and extended. And, uh, so uh, we do have room that we could come and take some up that don't have names and do that. But, yeah. Hey, Troy, is there any plans to widen the road to around this area to help with the yeah, so a development just got approved by the city council behind the library here uh, on the horse pasture. Um, in that, that creates a bypass for the city that the city desperately needs. So Sawney Drive right here will extend on over to Pilgrim Mill. Uh, so now it all starts with the state. They own Sawney Drive. Uh, I've talked to them before, but now that something has finally happened, uh, we're going to be really pushing hard uh, to get that to be a four lane bypass, you know, around town. Uh, the city right now is finishing up a Buford Dam Road extension. Buford Dam is going to go from the lake all the way to the, the fairgrounds on Castleberry. Uh, there'll be a red light there at the Napa on uh, Veterans Memorial. Uh, so that's going to help people bypass the square. You know, that's where our bottleneck becomes is the square here, but we've got two state routes intersecting. What about the 18 wheeler? So in the talk with the state, kind of what they're thinking, or this is the state, so <laughs> I'll take what I'm saying as the gospel. <clears throat> this bypass, they're thinking they would make that Highway 20. So 20 would go 
and turn it Sony Drive and go to the Mill, and then you pick 20 back up down at exit 14. So that would bypass, you know, except for delivery trucks or, you know, still not going to change. Trucks going to Tyson's, they still got to be able to get in there. But that's really going to help. Are they going to build by the cemetery? By the cemetery? That's where some of that farm is. I live right there. And by the cemetery. Oh, oh no. No, so it's down in the right one. Well, it's right. It's right behind where we're at now. So it's down this way. Okay. Yep, it's okay. right here where we're at. Okay. And that development's got uh, uh, pickle social, like pickleball, and a restaurant and bar, and they've got other uh, retail and that. And I know that that's one of them. Troy, the traffic in downtown is just horrible. Have y'all done a traffic study and employed somebody to? Find those lights so that you can get to it quicker. So here's the problem. Okay. <laughs> it's, on, it's owned by the state of Georgia. Oh, is it? Highway 9 and Highway 20 are controlled by the state. Uh, so here a while back, within the last two months, I called them. I said, look, you know, please come look at it. So they did retime the lights a little bit. Yeah. You know, but uh, there's a problem as you're coming between the courthouse. And the county admin building, the, the road kind of shifts a little. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, I've almost been side swapped a dozen times. Yeah. I asked them to paint a dotted line to show the people that, hey, this shifts a little. <laughs> Six months later, they finally painted that line. Because um, I said, look, we'll go paint the line. No, you can't do that. No. You know, because it's a state road. They painted it and that lasted about three months. They repaved the road. Well, now we don't have the dotted line. So <laughs> all over. Um, three months ago, we've asked them. So there's one street on, on the square the city owns, and that's where Happy Family and Village Burger are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So traffic backs up terribly. People trying to turn left at good. Yeah. We can't make it where you can't turn left because that intersection is the states. So three and a half months ago, we have asked them, please, at a meeting with them the first of December. Yeah, they still haven't. All they have to do is put one metal sign up there. That's all they have to do. Could they make a turn signal there? The problem, if you have a turn signal, if the first car wants to go straight, nothing happens. No. That's the problem. Well, that same that same thing happens though now at the courthouse and everything too. I mean, you got a flashing yellow light there now, but still. Yeah. Would... But if the first one, the flashing stone, you can turn at your own risk, right. uh, which is a risk a lot of times. But, <laughs> uh, um, well, we are we're working on uh, with the state as well as you're coming in Highway 20, expanding from Kelly Mill Road to Castleberry. A right turn only lane. So if you're coming into town on 20, once you got past Kelly Mill, you can get in the right lane and go and never stop at the light. It would be a free flowing. You can go down. Well, for a German check. We're doing what we can, but we're hand handcuffed by the fact that it was a major road. You'll have to do a Google search for it. This is, you know, some of those Amazon. <laughs> from the city center on 20 there's some land next to those apartments are there any plans to build anything there and that to my knowledge the land's for sale but nothing's nothing's been brought to the city you've got a creek there that runs parallel to 20 so it makes that a little tougher tougher to do something there now that developer of the apartments right across from the city center, directly across, there's actually two creeks in there. Uh, that developer gave the city 10 acres there. Uh, so we'll be eventually extending walking trails through. They'll go up and tie into the apartments where they can come down across a couple of creeks. They can come over to the city center all by trails. Not good yet. Are y'all going to do anything about the dumpy houses on? So those things are kind of generically changing on their own. Um, now that the city centers come in, um, 
I know of several houses that have been bought and now they're going in and gutting them and they're redoing them. And you were talking about home prices. I'm a builder, been building in this county since 93. There's a guy that bought a house in there, 1,200 feet for 275, and then he's gutting it. And the basement is seven foot yeah. ceilings. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, and then uh, there's actually some empty lots in there that uh, the owner actually called me saying he wanted to do some, could he do some apartments? I'm like, no, but we'll give you small lots and build some nice little houses, you know? So yeah. I think that that's what's going to end up happening that will all get redeveloped. Mm -hmm. uh, Y'all have any say so over that? I mean, well, if, any... if it's already zoned yeah. and they're meeting that zone and we have no say so. Yeah. If they want to change the zone and then we can have yeah. some input. Do you have a grand opening date? <laughs> so I, we don't yet. The man that I know one, trust me, I'll be screaming. But a target thing, yeah. I think that the bit we're going to be able to turn the buildings over the businesses in about March. So then it's going to be according to, you know, you got some they'll build out in a month. Some may take, you know, I'm talking to some of our restaurant guys and they're saying we paid for our equipment in November and they're saying we're going to get it in May. Yeah. You know, so yeah. that's what's so hard to pinpoint it. The center will be done this spring. It's just a matter of how long does it take for the tenants to get there. What's the percentage of lease out? We're already at 75%. So uh, I honestly think by the time we actually open, we'll be at 100. We're, we're at 75, but then we've got an entire upstairs that, you know, where we're different being city owned in the commercial world, if I wanted to rent to you, Okay, I'm gonna give you thirty thousand in tenant improvement money, and here go at it. Well, we can't do that as a city um, because of gratuities clause in the state constitution. So we have to negotiate well, what's fair for us to spend in upgrading or doing part of their build out. So that's what drags on some of the negotiations. Okay, we'll do this. We won't do that. I know over the years there's been some ideas going around about building up around on Castleberry around the fairgrounds some kind of environments. Has there been any more discussions or do you see anything happening in the future right now? Some sort of environment. Yeah, yeah just kind of like some, like kind of what you're doing coming to on a much smaller scale. Right. Or some live work play environment. Yeah. Like well we I don't know where the property would be that you could do it. Um you know the uh, we actually be honest when we were looking for somewhere for the city center, you know, we actually thought about the front part of the fairgrounds parking lot of doing something. Um, that wouldn't have been near as big as it is now. And, and then the property that we got, that was the hard part for the city center to get the property to actually be able to do it. Um, you know, we were able to take what most people would look at being a, a troubled piece of land and turn that trouble into the biggest draw of it. You know, the park in the middle, it's going to be amazing, but from a developer standpoint, they want to maximize every inch. And we're saying, look, we're fine with that being a park. You know, so yeah, over there, I just don't know where the land would come from to do anything. What about Mashburn Landing? What retail is going in there? Are so that I, retail? Yeah, that's going to have retail. I want to say it was about six, seven buildings, something like that. I don't know what's do they have planned for that? I know that they're going to have to start that pretty soon. Um, they were, they got approved for that six, seven buildings. Um, and there's been talks they'd like to bring a Publix there, you know, a new Publix. But then if you do that, you lose all that other to a parking lot. So, um, so I don't really know where it's, what tenants are going to be. What about the development next to Costco? Is that? Going through development next to Costco. Yeah, I thought y'all had the property at um, oh, Ball Ridge and Park Okay, so that somebody has applied to have that annexed, mm -hmm. uh, but then withdrew his application. Mm -hmm. So um, that's where that's. And what about further on the road at Turner Park? 
Yeah, so that's going, that's going to have, uh, if you drive by there, kind of the buildings that are going perpendicular to the road. Those are vertical mixed use buildings. They're going to have retail on the bottom. I know they've got a bed and breakfast. They still got to build a couple of what will probably be restaurant spaces out closer to the road. Mm -hmm. But from there mm -hmm. over to Turner, all that's commercial. That project's got about 350,000 square feet of commercial. Um, so then you've got that vertical mixed use going up now. There's some apartments behind it, some townhomes and single family to the left. If you're facing it from marketplace, so there's no people behind the door. Yeah, I think that's part of what would be on the corner. Okay. Uh, I believe it's been a while since we went through that. <clears throat> yeah. So. yeah What's the project plans here at Seven Down and Three Sixty Nine? Couldn't tell you. That's in the county. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you talked a lot about commercial, like retail and restaurants and stuff like that. What do you see? The office market being in coming, you think we have a shortage? Do you think there's? Yeah, I think we have a, I think we have a shortage right now. Uh, that don't have anybody other than the upper levels of the city center. I don't know any new that's going in right now. I think, it seems like the I think everybody's a little scared of yeah. the, uh, pandemic and how many do I need space and not need space. I think we'll share our last question. I expect a time for it. I am sorry, but I'm not up to speed on the Mashburn landing. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, so that one has, uh, I don't remember the exact number, so you'll have to forgive me, but you can see the apartments that are that are going up and nearing completion now. So then in front of that, you've got six or seven retail buildings, very nice looking. Um, they've got some townhomes and single family, and then I think they've got a indoor Climate controlled storage, main storage. Thanks for having me. Last question. Rumors about golf cart ordinance. So, so we're, we're getting one of the things that takes forever. We're working on that where you can drive a golf cart in the city and get 35 or 100 feet back. We can get to use that. And where you get in trouble is the state. We can make it legal, but it's illegal to cross the state highway. But you can drive your lawnmower, with your lower deck on it, all the way through the town, go around the square. It's legal. But I don't park it. Uh, the last thing is he was talking, I could get drunk in a different place in the city center for two weeks. <laughs> Breweries, distilleries. Yeah. If I would have an Uber pad somewhere <laughs> in there for us. All right. Uh, we're going to try to get Jan here at 1 o'clock. We're going to review some numbers if you haven't seen this before. Let me say Jan did show up. Wave to everybody, Jan. Jan's here now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Curtis? <laughs> These numbers are mostly single family residential numbers, just for Forsyth County, so we don't have a lot of land and stuff. Let's hear from Tim on the land. Not a lot of townhomes and condos. Um, and we're going to compare basically the fourth quarter 2021 with the fourth quarter of the previous year. Okay. And we, it's kind of intellectual property. We're not allowed to give out the whole thing, but if you need a slide or two, just let me know. I'd be happy to give it to you. Okay. Right. okay, we're going to skip that. All right. So this is cumulative monthly sales. You can see the uh, chart over here. Uh, okay, the red is uh, 2021, the lighter one's 2020 to 2019. Up top, so you can see sales for 2021 were actually down from the previous year. Okay. Um, now we can see why, if remember the previous year, it makes more sense when you look at it per month, right? So what happened is this was second quarter, right? March of 20. 20 by now? That's two years. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. So we shut down in March, right? Everybody got terrified here. And then by about April or May, I'd say, right? And we have a lot of agents in the world who don't chime in. Everybody's like, because I can tell you from an agent standpoint, when that stuff shut down, those of us that were in business in 2008 <laughs> got really scared. <laughs> for like 10 years of progress down the drain. But pretty much everybody kind of calmed down and realized, okay, the world's not going to end. They made up for it the rest of the year. So if you drop here, 
and we didn't see the normal seasonal slowdown because what normally would have happened here got pushed out. So in the end, it was probably about the same. That's still what I keep that. Right. So here's our change in number sold, and it's uh, this quarter compared to the previous year, right? So this is uh, fourth quarter this year compared to fourth quarter last year. And you see it's up and down, and it started that before the pandemic, right, which was kind of our first cause for uh, maybe the market starting to correct. It's pretty much been in a seller's market since 2011, the seller's market, over 10 years now. So this is a sign that things are starting to price slide. The argument against that thought is there just aren't any homes to buy. Like you said, how many buyers do you have pre-approved right now? Wow. <laughs> wait. Just, just wait. Four months. Yeah, months. Adam, I know you're seeing the same thing. How many buyers pre-approved, ready to go? Binders. Binders. <laughs> uh, so it was down the second, uh, the third, fourth quarter. Again, that's most of the last year, third, fourth quarter were bigger than usual. There's your actual numbers by quarter. So 44, 46 for the whole county. Previous year was close to 4,700. This shows you by price range. So if you look at the top, there were declines in the three price ranges below 500 and increases in every price range above 500. So why is that? <coughs> price went up. <laughs> I think we're going to see a price went up like 21% last year and like 14% the previous year. So prices went up and people were still buying them. Okay. And there's much lower inventory at the lower levels. Right. So the stress sales, you can see on the right here, it's a combination of short sales and foreclosures. You'll see there were virtually no short sales. Pretty much for two years, right? Point two percent over there. And why is that? Why is there no short sales? Interest rates low. Yeah, so their equity is low. Yeah. Like in two thousand and eight, when the thing crashed, I went to sell my house. I had to sell my house because I lost my job. Well, I just bought it with a hundred percent finance. <laughs> uh, no skin in the game. No skin in the game. See ya. Whereas now, if I'm in trouble, because there's still people in trouble, right? You still have bankruptcies, divorces, things like that. Um, they can sell because they have equity. In so this, this is there's always going to be some that's super low. Anybody remember like the peak of the depression, recession, whatever? What that number was in Forsyth County? Forty percent. What do you think it was in Gwinnett County? Forty percent for like a couple of years. I mean, it was crazy for those of us that were around back then. We try not to remember it, but yeah. it comes back every now and then. Just just. <laughs> yeah, <I'm laughs> um, across the top is new homes by price point, the middle one is resale, and then the total at the bottom. So this is for number of sales, like we talked about, for resale above 500, pretty much every every quarter. Less on the below 500, but mostly because again, they're not there. What's the lowest price for agents and lenders in the room? What's the lowest price new home you can buy besides that? Is there one of the four? Yes? No? How much? 303. 303? Where was it? <laughs> it was by itself or was it a neighbor? Okay. That's unusual. Yeah. Everybody else had one below four? Seriously? I saw one for 290, but it was like it did the border house. Shady Shores? Because there are new ones in Shady Shores are like the size of the state. Okay, so really, this is this is point there, right? This is our supply of listings. The green line is what what we call a balanced market. Six months of inventory. Below that is a seller's market. Above that is a buyer's market. So you can see, if you look to the left, right in 2012. Well, we basically in 2011, midway through 2012, we went to a seller's market, and we've been in it for nine years. And every quarter we say we can't go any lower. And every point of proven wrong. <laughs> There's now the lowest point. And we'll go over what the actual number is, but uh, obviously this this is the story. And until this goes up, we're going to see this, right? So the red line is median sales price. So this is something we all understand: supply and demand. Uh, 
as supply is going down, price just keeps going up. Tim uh, Avenue will tell us the new construction, probably not going down any time soon. Just yeah. a second. So, I mean, that's like, I like to hear, like, for the lenders with three raises in interest rate this year, like, just ballpark. What's, what's that not for first time home buyers? How much price off the house is losing for every half a point? Um, you're looking probably $35 for $100,000. So, $500,000 on a house, you make it $80 a month. Make a yeah, well, especially if you can't buy anything from the tree. Well, and, and if we're <laughs> up to, you know, by the end of the year, we may be at 4%. I mean, versus back in December, or December 275. Yeah. So, how many people are going to refinance under three? Oh, <laughs> it was crazy, crazy. right? 15 years, 2%. Yeah, crazy. So, now we, for, for the agents and lenders in the room, what we're going to have to do is explain to people right ahead of four percent is actually a good rate because <laughs> you know if, if I've only ever seen three, four percent is outrageous. Let's get the government involved. No, no, all right. So, here's median sales price, which is definitely a big part of the story. You can see across the top, it's increased every quarterly period of the last two years, and we'll see the next slide more than that. Um, so, it was up 21 percent. Compared to 2020, 34% since 2019. Wow. So the median sale price in the South County, 475,000. One long ago, we'd be like, man, Milford's crazy. Their average sale price is 450. Right. right? We don't think this is Alfred and Milford. 475. Crazy. And this shows it's literally, this was our only time we were close. It's gone up every year, quarter over quarter, since 2013. We've had price increases every quarter, on exception. Mostly because rates have been low lately, <laughs> so people can still afford them. Right? Rates go up, they change. Any questions so far? Pretty kind of the same. I don't know the other realtors are there used to be people, the number one question we usually get is how's the market? Now people tell me how the market. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like crazy market. Sells market. I never sold house in like three hours. <laughs> Your job must be so easy. We love that. Oh yeah. Put a sign in the yard. Out for a time. And make twenty grand. <laughs> no competition. <laughs> All right. So here's new versus resale. As you can see, that's the tightest it's been. Right. As new has got more construction. It's pulled, it's pulled to resale. And there's less inventory on there. Are any builders doing uh, pre-sales? I mean, um, inventory homes? Why not? They don't have to. <laughs> they got 10 contracts and 20 buyers on the way to you. They're bidding a lot. Yeah, who told me about that? Uh -huh. Tell, so there's actually build, bidding on the lot before you pick the house. And some won't even let you. What? Look at the lot. They're they're they've got the lots. The lots are there, yeah. but you cannot buy that lot until they start construction. Yeah. And they might only do two a month, right? At least two lots a month, three lots a month. Whereas again, they, and they've learned from the past, right? It's probably not bad. They they obviously got caught bad in the recession with fifty inventory homes. And, you know, lost their fair amount. So <laughs> so I get it, but that's creating demand too. I mean, it's, it's crazy, right? Like you said, it's frustrating time to buy. So there's a percent of sales price to uh, original list pricing that that's talking about. Um, the top line is 105%. <laughs> so you can see the average is over 100%. And that's what you're talking about. This is 46. Five or six. Five, 60. Whatever contract, 560. It was listed at 550. Right. And then the 560. 560. And then came down to 501 and back to 5. Yeah. So just because people will pay for it, and you do some crazy too, right, right? So let me know if you have some other intel. Um, if you're getting a loan, it's the last of rates. And that's the thing, too, is a lot of people do have the cash because during COVID, people got cash heavy, right? Weren't traveling, kids weren't playing travel ball, which we all know that'll put a family <laughs> uh, budget. Uh, weren't going out to eat as much. So people got the cash layer up or commuting probably. 
So here's your median days on market, nine for the whole year. Wow. Yeah. First quarter was crazy. I remember that. It was 13 days. It took it forever. <laughs> <laughs> Ready to move. You put your house on the floor. Although what we're seeing since it's a seller's market, yeah, yeah, you can buy it, but I want to stay for six months rent free. Sure. Someone knew my lease, no problem. Yeah. Price reductions. You can see the average is 14% for the year compared to 37% uh, for last year. Way down, obviously. The only reason it's 14% is the super greedy sellers. Right, my house is worth 500, but maybe it's sold for 520. Let's list for 600. Right. Yeah. As realtors, I'll tell you what we say. Sure. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of saying you'll never get that. And then <laughs> boom, someone comes along from California, New Jersey. Oh, we'll, we'll pay that cash. Yeah. Okay. Nine days to change. <laughs> so no price reductions. Okay, so this is kind of the uh, summary of the ones that sold. So 100% sales to list price, 11 days on the market. Going to the right. If you didn't reduce your price and it's your first time on the market, you're making 101 percent and selling in seven days. And that's the majority of the market. That is 77 percent of the market. 78 percent of the market. If it's your pr no price reduction, you've been on the market before, so you're kind of stubborn. But the beauty of this is you chase the market, but the market was going up. So when I listed the first time, I was above market value. Typically, you might list between four to six months. This is a quarterly total, that 1,024 type of place. Yeah. Yep. That's a quarter, what like 4,000? Anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so by the time six months came by, the market went up 21% a year. So it's got a 10% in six months. It's a spot up, right? And then if uh, I had to have my price reduced, wasn't previously listed, now I'm down to 94%. It takes 38 days. You know, what? This is a really stubborn people. Price reduced previously listed, they got 92% and 139 days on the market. It's only 3% of the market. So those are the ones I know where to go. Like, sure, if I get this from my house, I'll move. Anybody working with rentals at all? Is it still impossible to find someone close to rent? Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, sure. there's a neighborhood, um, Hurstville and 20. It is nothing but rental homes and they're building. The front end is is all rented out, but every home in there is a rental unit. Like this one right here. Yeah, right, right next to it. It's right here, so like right behind the gas station. Yeah. Crazy. So what is the prospect on that? I mean, would it have been advantageous for them to turn it into selling at, at the height of the market? Or is there another plan for this to be a long scope? Maybe our finance people know, but I think. Uh, Wall Street money is just figured out. The rent rates and appreciation, we're paying way more money in housing, right? And a house doesn't go to zero, right? Which yeah. the stock can go to zero. So, I mean, anybody else? But she wants to talk about it. I don't know if it was the last real estate council or the one before. Mm -hmm. A lot of our younger generations, they're, they're not wanting to buy homes, they're not making the commitments. Yeah. So, there is this rental market and they don't care. They don't care. That's right. They don't stay for long periods of time. I mean, you know, being yes. banking and hearing them coming like, no, we don't, we don't need to buy a home. We don't need to stay here. I only see my dog for six months because I went somewhere else for twenty five cents. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. And the job market being so good, yeah, they'll yeah. they'll jump so ship. Now we have the neighborhoods coming up where you're going to just do the rentals, and it's a small home because it's single or. Newly married or new family, and they don't care about having the home. Yeah, yeah, they want to be out of the city. You got a lot of folks um, moving into those subdivisions <coughs> that have they've sold their house. Yeah, right. I mean, we've got a friend who, who lives over there at the one uh, twenty in, in Hurtville, where he, you know, he had a house over here back up at Sunny Mountain. He lived there for two years, made a ton of money because of the appreciation, and then he said to himself, well, I'm going to take a big pile of cash rent over here um, in that subdivision for a year and see what the market does, right? Yeah, I personally just did that, too. I had my house. <laughs> I took advantage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had my house listed for 585 sold it for 615 and I went for a year. It's 
work. It's stress free. Yeah. Right there. Sometimes I work. Yeah. Not with it. I told my wife, I tried, she could do it. We tried. I said, we could live in a Hilton for two years. <laughs> Way ahead. Room service every day. Room service. Yeah. Oh, it's our home. Fine. <laughs> okay. Not a very good realtor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is failed listing. So if, if your home didn't sell, you either withdrew it from the market or expired. I suspect most of these are withdrawals. Uh, we can see it's 11%. Uh, last uh, yeah, last year was 11 percent. Two years ago, it was 35 percent, which is about used to be the lowest. 35. I suspect most people just couldn't get what they wanted, or couldn't find the house to buy. Like, we're gonna go, and they started looking at the rental market. Couldn't find one of those either. I'm like, just say what? No, agree. Yeah. Unprecedented. So this is a combined the closed and the failed listings, or finalized listings. 89 of them sold. 72 sold without reducing their price, 17 had to reduce. So 11 didn't sell, 17 had to reduce their price. So even in today's market, 28 of every 100 listings are overpriced. That's really subjective. It's, if buyers willing to pay for it, it's overpriced. Jim. Jim, back on the rental, I heard a big rancher talk about that. Somebody called me and said, I just sold my house for 50,000 more than I could afford. Now I'm in an apartment. He said, No, get out of that apartment because next year when you go to buy a house, it's going to be 15% more and the interest rates will be up on 4%. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. So that's why I'm telling my clients, hey, yeah. you don't need to rent, you need to buy it. Yeah, if you're working with buyers, I think Clark Howard would say the same thing. And most people respect Ramsey and Howard. So I would definitely point to them and say, I mean, you might be right. Who knows? Yeah, principal reduction too. Principal reduction, yeah. So, who knows, right? Kind of the difference today is one global incident can, can shut everything down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's the thing we don't. Real or fabricated. <laughs> All right. I think we're almost done here. You want to see? Um, Steve Schultz is here, and Meredith does an appraisal too, who's done appraising for 30 something years in our county. Big changes in your industry. You want to tell everybody what's going on? Does what? he need to come up here? So? Yeah. yeah. You mind if you So, tough time being an appraiser right now. Uh, yeah, some changes in the industry that have just. Have just <laughs> Somewhere around back yeah. step over there. Our virtual uh, audience thanks you. <laughs> okay. You're welcome. Uh, some recent changes that, that have come up. Uh, Fannie and Freddie are going to start relying more on desktop appraisals uh, starting this year for their loans. And uh, they've been last year and with COVID, they did a lot of desktop because they didn't want us going in houses. And, Sorry, I don't want to go in houses, so it worked out pretty good. But they're going to be <clears throat> using these desktop forms. Uh, they're completely similar forms, but a completely different process for getting through the, the appraisal. So basically, the desktop means it's done from the desktop. The appraiser never sees the property. Uh, that's no different than the COVID response they, they put out, but. Um, the big difference right now with that is that they want a sketch of the home. So when we go out and do the appraisal, we measure the house, we provide a sketch in the, in the appraisal. And uh, so now they're going to want a sketch in the home without me seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> or without me measuring it. So their answer to that is, okay, we're going to rely on a third party to provide you that information. So. It's Tim's listing. I got to get Tim to go out there with his. They got they've got an app that they of course and an app or you can use FaceTime whatever. Go through the house and basically let me walk him through the house. And say okay, go in the dining room now. Show me the ceiling. Show me the floor. Show me the. Go all around it and then the square footage that I use will be coming from uh, other uh, another third party source. 
So that, that's, that's a big change that Fannie and Freddie have come out with this year. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. 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 And then they wonder, well, why'd you come in low on that? But these numbers tell the whole story of why stuff did approach by now. Um, and, yeah. I did. So if you guys go to that, like if, as for an agent, and you can and you come and say, well, the tax records show that, let's say it's 1,500 square feet, but like my current one, they're missing 400 square feet of a section. So how do you fight that then? Well, you got to hope that you have reliable information and that your third party information sources knowledgeable enough to go out there and do it. And it may not be the agent. It may be the homeowner on a refinance, or it may be a property manager. It may be a builder. You know, you just don't know who that third party guy is going to be. They don't care who it is. But the, I don't think they really care, but the appraiser should care. Because in order for me to develop an opinion value, I need accurate information. So I'm not going to throw a number out there not knowing that it, you know, well, it may have 400 more square feet than what they're saying. Well, Steve, when you were when you were in that hole where they were doing the 2055 drive-by COVID appraisal, what percentage of that was your total appraisal? I know for me, if I had very few that requested that. I still had the majority of my lenders wanted full appraisal. So I don't know if like the hybrids and the desktops are going to be the same where it's a very small percentage and lenders are still requiring it full appraisal. I don't know what the percentage will be because then, you know, we don't know that. Right. And just like we don't know, and I think uh, these lender guys will tell you, even last year they were waiting for some yeah. appraisal. Right. appraisal. Right. You didn't, they didn't get an appraisal, period. But during that COVID time, my my volume on on uh, desktop stuff was was pretty heavy and it was full it was the full form it wasn't the drive-by form it was on the right full i mean it was still the full form but you had you didn't have to go see the property i didn't go I mean, for me I, during covid i never quarantined because i was still doing a full appraisal yeah. yeah well i did a lot of those too you know mask and gloves and booties <laughs> and all that yeah Hazmat <laughs> yeah. yeah. They, you said they're changing the way you get paid. Not the way you get paid, the way they order them, they're putting out bid requests. So, you know, they require, Fannie supposedly requires, you know, quality over speed and quantity. So, right now, what they're doing is they're putting out bid requests for, uh, and these are the price of management companies, and actually, some lenders are going to this too. Where they put out a bid request, you respond to it as the appraiser, and you bid your fee and turn time, and then you're up against probably hundreds of other appraisers for that same job. <clears throat> Quickest and cheapest get it, obviously. So I probably get one out of ten I bid on. And how long does it take you to value like what you're gonna bid? 15, 20 minutes. So it's two and a half hours. Yeah, if I do, if I, and I might get six or eight of those a day. And see, and I'm very rarely bid because I'm like, it's just when I started bidding, if I very rarely got them, so I don't even bid. Well, it depends on how hungry you are. You can't compete if somebody's going out there and saying, I'll do it for $200 in two days. Right, right. But for that, if you're bidding, but is the buyer seeing that on the respective end? Like if you're saying, okay, I'll do it, yeah, they're not. So the bank is pocketing or the appraiser no. is pocketing that money. I had a buyer tell me the other day that, that they would pay $670 for the appraiser. Yeah. 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 VA ones are 650 You got four. Yeah. So that's the big difference. What percent? Are you seeing a percent to come in low? Ballpark appraisers? I hear a lot of people saying 15, 20%. For me, it hasn't been that high. It's you know, probably more around 10. Ten, but, yeah, I mean, know. I haven't had that many come in low, even with the increasing market, because I'm making the increasing market adjustment. Right. But I saw some an interesting fact that the majority of appraisers are not making increasing market adjustments in their appraisals, and I was like, why wouldn't you? I don't understand that. Well, that's, I mean, that's not just required by Payne and Freddie, but that is. So it's required. Those adjustments are required. They should be made. Yeah. Um, you know, but in this, where you see things coming low, is it, for example, I have one where the, the guy bought the house a year ago for 360. 
a year ago. Um, for whatever reason, it's moving. So he puts it on the market for 375. That's going to cover his commission and maybe a little bit of money, right? He's got an offer to four and a quarter. So now I've got a prior sale of a year ago for 360 and a sales price today of four and a quarter. And he ain't done anything to have. <laughs> so. One more question, then we'll get on. Uh, with this third party that's going to come in and help you all out, what is that going to do with the uh, the time that the three people are going to take? Because we know y'all are busy right now. Like, well, that that's interesting question because that's the reason that there's one of these desktops so they're short term time because they're you know appraisers are busy and, and it, sometimes it might take a week or 10 days to get an appraisal back so now they want it quicker but that could actually take longer if i can't find the right person to go out there yeah then i gotta find somebody to go do it do it right you have to find the third party to do the thing yeah. they gotta do it right yeah what that take Steve will stick around and say, Steve will stick around and say, Steve will stick around and Jack, give it up. Tim, you want to give a quick update? What the bills are still up in Sutton County? The market's crazy. I think anything's on. I got to put blue tape. Yeah. So you're in agreement with Ramsey and Clark Howard that this might be the cheapest you could buy a house ever. New one. Um, even, even with the uh, increased cost of all the supplies and, you know, and the time it takes to get windows and everything, uh, it just has to slow down because they just keep raising prices and charge more for lots and getting in and fill that stock. So do you think there's still a lot of people coming in from the bigger markets? Like we always talk about California and New York. And so the price to them is still like, it's a deal. Are we seeing that here or is that at all Prescott? My son uh, built houses in Colbo, he goes to Cherokee. Um, and he said everybody in front of the house in Michigan is working. Every single buyer. Yeah. yeah. So it's interesting, right? So we're still susceptible to whenever the market corrects. But I remember during the when the recession hit and before it hit, we were like, well, land has been three or 4% a year, so we're probably not going to get affected. But I think swept across the country, we were affected. So I'm, I'm hesitant to say <laughs> like we're different, but do you think that, that does make us a little different? Uh, yeah. Right, we don't know. I mean, really, it's just, I mean, nobody even understands the market. <laughs> it is. I was talking to an investor that I work with, built a nice family in Houston. And they uh, built it for to help out some numbers, like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a unit. And they already had somebody offering three hundred dollars. He said, "Well, double our money, like make thirty million dollars. It makes no sense. Yeah. We're trying to get it done as fast as possible." <laughs> <laughs> <Before they were. laughs> but the rental rates have gone up so much that they can justify paying thirty million. Yeah. So it's just. Uh, he said there are no rules to that. It's just not free. And that's kind of the wild Which thing. A little scared. That we had a conversation with some people looking at some land this week, and we said, "Well, the land's worth what the developer can put on it, right? If I only put five lots on it, it's worth X. If I get the county or city to let me put twenty on it, it's worth X times three. So it doesn't matter what the market value is per se. It's how can I make the amount of money I need to make, right? Which is Totally different from anything we've seen. And that's what the Airbnb market's so hot, right? If I run my numbers on Airbnb, I could pay way more than a first time home buyer who's, who's watching every day. So that that's really what's, what's skewing things. We should have someone next quarter, Jesse, from the county to talk about the Airbnb uh, regulations. <laughs> have those been settled yet? Just a yes or no? No. Okay. How long has it been going on? Uh, two, two years? Year. Year. I mean, yeah, I'm four or five. five yeah. Yeah, it's, it's been a while. Okay, real quick, a while thing. But when you leave, just bring your, uh, you can 
fold your uh, lunch box, you don't have to squash them in the in the empty box over there and stack them up to make it easier for people to clean up. So here's the last one. This is supply, which this this is what's driving everything. Red is this year. Uh, the other colors last year. So if you just look at the bottom, last year we're 0.9. I'm sure I stood here, Justin, and say, I can't get any lower. <laughs> uh, this year was 0.5. Right now, just half a month, they're throwing a whole count. And save. Um, so, all right, anything we didn't cover or any questions or input? It's still kind of crazy. And we're going into peak season. Because that's one thing I will say, right? Realtors, we did see the seasonal curve this year that we didn't see last year. So it is, it has slowed a little bit. I know Mark said you've got a little less expect inspections than you know with pools this year. Um, so we should see March and April. We usually two, excuse me, January and April are your two biggest listing months. So we should see some more inventory coming on, but only if people want to move and have a place to go. They want to pay with a higher interest rate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we do have a giveaway too, right, Jesse? All right, thank you, Jack. You want, you want to pick? Uh, um, Go ahead, Jesse, you grab it. You'll make a new friend. <laughs> new mom, by the way. Give her a hand. Hey All right. Is that it? Let's give the chamber staff a hand. See all this stuff. They had to get here at 10 o'clock to coordinate.